have wraps from uh, five states where we have field projects. We have a field project in Texas, Nevada, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Delaware. And then we have an additional wrap from New Hampshire that we've been utilizing in the laboratory. We have RAS uh, from the Texas field project, which was a manufactured waste asphalt shingles. We have um, RAS that was used in the Indiana field project and also in the Delaware field project. And all of those were manufactured asphalt shingles, which are less aged than the tear-off asphalt shingles that have been sitting on a roof for, for a number of years. And we have a source of those from Texas and from California, again, to utilize in the laboratory. We have a whole string of base binders that we utilize. Uh, we have uh, two Texas binders, a 64 minus 22 and a 70 minus 22 that's polymer modified from the Texas field project. We have a Nevada 64 minus 28 polymer modified from the Nevada project. We have an Indiana 64 minus 22 uh, we have from that field project and a 58 minus 28. We have two Wisconsin binders that are used in the field project there, 58 minus 28 and 52 minus 34 and a Delaware 64 minus 28 used in the field project there. In addition, we have a New Hampshire 64 minus 28 unmodified and a Minnesota 58 minus 28 uh, that we've added in again in the laboratory. What you see here in the parentheses is uh, the delta TC value uh, after 20 hours of PAV aging, and that's defined as the temperature where the S threshold is reached in BBR PG grading minus the temperature where the M value is reached. And that's becoming a, a popular parameter. Um, in this case, we feel that it's a good way to look at the quality of the base binder that you're starting from. So this is your virgin binder that you're adding into the stiff recycled binder from the wrap or the RAS or both. And so you need to you need a good place to start from. Um, we uh, have learned that really you need to be have you need to be toward zero or toward the positive side. So for example, this negative 4.6 uh, was not a, a very good place to start in our Texas field project when we add in very heavily aged Texas wrap and RAS uh, for, versus this New Hampshire binder, which, which has a positive delta TC value. So we, we think that we're going to recommend looking at this as a way to look at the initial uh, or the quality of your base binder that you're starting from. We also have a number of recycling agents. We have a couple of aromatic extracts, which are sort of the old school recycling agents or rejuvenating agents. We have a paraffinic recycling agent that we purposely put in there in the lab only uh, because we know that it will, will not um, behave the way we want it to in terms of rejuvenating um, the recycled binder. We have two of the sort of newer more commonly used greener tall oil products. We have a vegetable oil and two modified vegetable oils, and we have two reacted bio-based oils. So we have a pretty wide spectrum of recycling agents that we're looking at. And then we have the virgin aggregates from our five field projects. And all of this mess gets put together into uh, both binder blends and mixtures. And of course, at the end of the day, we care about the behavior of the mixtures. Uh, the thing to, to remember here is that um, it matters how these things are combined, right? It matters what ingredients you have and then the proportions of the recipe that you're using. And so we're trying to come up with evaluation tools uh, to look at each combination that uh, a state or a contractor might want to examine. Um, so some of the things that we are uh, proposing to include in this draft ASHTO standard practice. Again, this would be for high RBR defined as 0.3 to 0.5, and that's the recycled binder ratio combined uh, for the wrap and the RAS uh, and re with recycling agents. Um, the, the whole point here is that uh, sometimes you can um, use a substitute base binder, meaning a softer base binder, and you can increase your RBR. But when you get up into these high levels, 0.3 to 0.5, uh, you really have to try something else, um, like a recycling agent. So we're, we're, we're suggesting uh, proposing some component materials selection guidelines. So how do you select the materials that you're going to put in this combination? 
Uh, how do you select the dosage of the recycling agent? Of course, that's going to be important to the performance. Uh, and how do you use that along with some economics of the recycling agents um, to combine the materials uh, in terms of how much wrap or RAS can you use? And I'll give an example of that. Um, we think it's important to look at the binder blend itself, and we would like to provide some guidelines on that. Uh, we have a little bit of information on recycled binder availability factor, uh, a recycled binder availability. In other words, how much of the binder can you count on from your recycled wrap or RAS? Uh, and then we think it's important to do a little bit of mixture evaluation uh, in terms of cracking. And then we've done a little bit of work on aging prediction and um, the effects of different climates. I'm going to step through these different parts. In terms of component material selection guidelines, uh, as I mentioned before, we feel that Delta TC is, is an important parameter. And uh, after 20 hours of PAV, uh, which is for practical purposes, instead of going 40 hours, we think that that Delta TC value should be greater than or equal to negative 4. We really shouldn't use those ones that are uh, more negative than uh, negative 4, like you saw on the list some minus 8 or some minus 4.6 materials. Uh, this parameter is at low temperatures, a uh, rheological parameter, and we also uh, looked into another parameter we call the crossover temperature. And the crossover temperature uh, is when um, the phase angle is 45 degrees or the G prime is equal to G double prime. So this is an intermediate temperature DSR parameter, whereas this is found from BBR data. And we feel that the crossover temperature uh, after 20 hours of PAB aging should be less than or equal to 30. And these two parameters are correlated, so it's not necessarily true that you would need to determine both of them. But we feel that if, if you could determine one of them, uh, that would be good to help pick a good quality base binder. For the recycled materials, we have the, a lot of sources of wrap. We think that the wrap high temperature PG grade or PGH should be less than or equal to 100. We have some in Texas that are greater than this. And we also feel that you have to limit the RAS. So the contribution of the RAS to the binder ratio, the recycled binder ratio, we feel should be less than or equal to 0.1. And that's based on some of our results uh, in the lab and, as well as the field. And that would be about 3% RAS. Of course, it, it matters the, the binder content of the RAS, but approximately. For the recycling agent, we are, we're still working on that uh, a little bit, um, but what we've determined is that we're, we're trying to sort of update the specifications for recycling agents so that you can uh, utilize more modern equipment like a 50 millimeter DSR plate or something like that. But we, we've, we found that you can't just characterize the recycling agent and pick which one you need. You really have to put it into a blend with your recycled binder and your base binder. Uh, so a little bit about the recycling agent dosage selection. Uh, we looked at three different methodologies for um, determining recycling agent dosage selection. The first one was uh, restoring the low temperature PG grade. And that ended up being too low of a dose um, with aging. So again, we think it's important to look at the effectiveness of these recycling agents with aging. Then we looked at trying to restore the delta TC to minus 5. And that gave a too high of a dose in terms of rutting of, a, of the mixture, uh, as well as probably for economics. And so uh, we, we found that restoring the continuous PG high grade to a target value that you would utilize in your climate gave a nice uh, balanced recycling agent dosage. So it was like the three little bears. So we, we went too, too low, then too high, and then we came to the just right. We also uh, think that the recycling agent dosage should be probably even lower than what's shown on this slide here in talking to some of uh, in, in industry maybe 6 to 8% might be the maximum that we would want to, to utilize. This dosage is as a percent of the total binder. And by total binder, we mean that virgin or base binder plus the recycled binder. Um, for wrap only mixtures, uh, we utilize the dosage goes in as 100% replacement of some of the base or virgin binder. Whereas when we have RAS and a big dosage greater than 5.5%, 
we actually do 50% replacement, 50% addition. And the reason that we do that is because we won't get good coating. We won't have enough uh, binder content to hold the mixture together if we do 100% replacement. So that was kind of a side uh, coating um, study that we did. Um, a little bit more about the recycling agent dosage selection. Uh, we have uh, blending charts that we can use to verify uh, the dosage to restore the continuous PG high temperature grade. But we also have sort of an easier way, a more practical way, um, to, to estimate the recycling agent dosage. So the recycling agent dosage can be estimated by um, figure, calculating the high temperature PG grade of the blend using the equation at the top of this slide. And so that's determined knowing the binder ratio of the wrap and the PG high of the wrap, the binder ratio contribution from the RAS and the PG high of the RAS, and the binder ratio from the base binder and the PG high of the base binder. So just a, just a weighted average basically here. So that PGH of your binder blend um, minus the PGH of the target that you're trying to utilize. So in Texas, it would be a 70, for example. In other climates, it might be a 64 or a 58. And then divided by this slope parameter, 1.8. And this 1.8 parameter comes from um, a combination of a lot of different blends, 15 recycled binder blends and 32 binder blends with recycling agents. And so for the 70 line is the black line. To restore to PGH of 70 is the black line. To restore to the PGH of 64 is the blue line. And so what this is is the, the measured PGH of the, of the recycled blend versus the recycling agent dosage. And we found, again, over a series of a wide range of RBRs, some with RAP, some with RAP and RAS, that 1.8 works pretty well um, for the newer tall oils, vegetable oils, and bio oils. Now, if you have a better number for this slope of how recycling agent affects uh, PG high, then, then because you know more about the specific recycling agent you're utilizing or the manufacturer can provide you with this number, then you then use that by all means. But this is a way to get a good uh, good estimate again, and you wouldn't want to go above uh, maybe maybe eight percent. Um, so how do we try to balance the materials proportioning? Uh, we can use that sort of limit of uh, either 8 or 10 percent recycling agent and those estimating equations that we just looked at. And so if we step through, I just want to step through, if we start off with a Texas PG64-22, which is sort of our lower quality base binder, and we start off with an equivalent RBR from RAP and RAS, but very high, a 0.5 RBR, <laughs> with 0.25 Texas wrap and 0.25 Texas tear-off shingles, so these are very heavily aged. And this wrap is also very heavily aged compared to that in, say, Wisconsin or Minnesota or New Hampshire. So we start off with something that's very unbalanced, and we use these equations. We would get an estimated recycling agent dosage of 20.5, which no one on Earth would put into, into a mixture. That's just ridiculous. And so that tells you that with this base binder, this wrap source, and this tear off shingles, you can't use that much of the, these recycled materials, is, is what it tells you. So let's try, to, let's try to figure out a combination that we can use. Okay, so the first thing that we could do is we could change um, the wrap and the RAS ratio. Okay, so now we could still have 0.5 RBR total, but we could reduce our RAS down to 0.1, which is our recommended limit, max, and keep our wrap at 0.4. When we do that, we, with this base binder, we would get a recycling agent dosage of 14.3 using those equations. So that's better, but it's still crazy high. So let, what else could we do? We could change the RAS type to, to manufactured waste shingles. And again, keeping the same 0.5 RBR total, now keeping the same 0.1 maximum RAS, but changing to manufactured waste shingles. Again, this has a much lower PGH than this. And now we're down to 11.5. Again, still too high. So what could we do next? We could change the wrap type. So now we can go from a Texas wrap to a New Hampshire wrap, which of course you wouldn't do practically, but I'm just trying to show you what you could do if you, if you were in a location that had less aged wrap. 
When you do that, you bring your RA dosage down to 7.7. .7. Now we're talking this, this is something that maybe we could do. So maybe we could utilize a 0.5 RBR with RAS included in a different climate than Texas because we couldn't use the Texas wrap. The last thing we can do is to change the base binder to a better base binder. So if we change it to a softer base binder, in this case, an Indiana PG58-22, and leave everything else the same, now we're down to a, a very reasonable recycling agent dosage of 5.3. So we could also look at the delta TC of these blends, but this is one way to, to sort of play with how much recycled materials can you utilize without, without being either uh, uneconomical or, or possibly having a rutting problem, because you're going to have a rutting problem if you have recycling agent dosages this high in the corresponding mixtures. Okay, we also think uh, that black space and use of the Glover Row parameter, which is defined here, and this is done at an intermediate temperature in the DSR, so we're still just using G star and delta results from the DSR. Uh, we're using 15C and 0 0.005 radians per second. So it's a different uh, frequency and temperature uh, than maybe traditionally utilized in, in your DSR, but it's something that can be easily measured. So when we, we can calculate this Glover Row parameter, or we can look at G star versus phase angle in black space shown here. So it's log of G star versus phase angle on an arithmetic scale. And what happens here is in black space, it really matters where you start in black space. So, so your blend might start out um, right here, and we're, your base binder, for example. We add in recycled materials, and it starts to move to the upper left corner. So with aging or recycling, you're moving up into this corner. So you're getting more stiff, and you're getting less able to relax stress or less flexible. So that's moving in this direction. If you add a recycling agent, you should be moving back and to the right. And the point here is that we want to move down and to the right and actually rejuvenate and increase this phase angle, not just drop down and soften or um, uh, use a softening agent. So it's important that you want to be moving back down this angled line to the lower right corner of black space. What we have shown on here is some uh, limits of 180 kilopascals and 600 kilopascals, and that would be limits on this Glover Row parameter. And those have been roughly set based on uh, some limited field data um, it, uh, of, of age-related cracking. Okay, so I'm going to look at uh, a few examples here of some of the tools that we're thinking about using. One of them is, is this, this black space diagram for the binder blends. And the whole time I'm going to be using the Wisconsin materials. The Wisconsin materials provide a, a, nice, uh, a nice story. Uh, in Wisconsin, uh, in the field, they have what we call a DOT control section, which is basically the maximum RBR that the DOT allows without a recycling agent. And so that ends up being 0.22 RBR. They have an increased RBR up to 0.31, and where they added in some recycling agent at a very low dosage, 1.2%, and it's a vegetable oil. So that's our low field dosage. They also have it without the recycling agent at that higher RBR. That's called the recycled control. Then uh, in the laboratory, oh, sorry, they have one more field section. It is, again, higher RBR, but this time using a softer base binder of 52 minus 34. Uh, so those are the, the four sections that they have in the field. And then in the lab, we did, uh, using our recycling agent dosage selection method, we added um, a section at that same RBR, but now we have what we would consider the selected or optimum higher dosage of recycling agents. So you can see how it's definitely higher than the field dosage. And then we increase the RBR even more to 0.5 and determine that optimum or selected recycling agent dosage of 9%, which is a little high. So we might not be able to use all the way up to 0.5 RBR with this combination of materials. So what you see here is the DOT control, again, is in black. And the points are basically this is after rolling thin film oven. The next point with aging, again, moving to the upper left corner of black space, is PAV 20 hours, and this is PAV 40 hours. And of course, the point is, is that you don't want to be in this possible start of cracking or way over here in, in the uh, 
cracking zone. So the, the, the black one is the lower RBR DOT control. Now when we increase the RBR to the light blue line, of course it, it shifts the, the line. The aging path is very similar in slope, but it shifts it up and to the left because we've added recycled materials. When we add in some recycling agent with the red line, it shifts it back down and to the right, so that's good. Um, but basically it kind of goes back to the DOT control um, status. Uh, and then if we soften, use a softer binder, um, it, it does about the same thing. It doesn't change it much. So it kind of goes back to the DOT control. Now when we, when we add in, again, same amount of recycled materials but more recycling agent, it, everything shifts down and to the right. And when we add in even more recycled materials to 0.5, again, it shifts down and to the right. So, so these mi mixtures, you might be concerned about, oh, no, are we going to have rutting? We've tested these mixtures in the Homburg test and, and, and found that they are, they are okay. So we would suggest testing a binder blend and making sure that after 40 hours of PAV aging that you don't end up up here. That, that's what we would suggest uh, with regard to this black space diagram. We have a little bit of information on the recycled uh, binder availability. And it's limited. It, it does have some variability associated with the methodology that we used. And it only looks at a specific wrap size. And you can't do this for RAS. But basically, we're trying to figure out where are we between uh, assuming that we have 100% of the wrap binder. In other words, all of it's going to melt off the wrap during mixing. Um, and be available, or do you have nothing available where it's just a black rock? And so we know that we're probably somewhere in the middle. For RAS, I think we're at black rock, uh, because you don't get temperatures high enough to uh, activate that binder. And I don't even know if you want that binder, because it's very stiff. But for RAP, we're somewhere in the middle. And what we found is our binder availability factor, which is shown on the y-axis here, is very well correlated with the RAP's high temperature PG grade. So you see here that the binder availability for Texas wrap, which again I mentioned has a very high PGH, it's maybe 107, uh, its binder availability factor is maybe 67%. And again, this is not the actual number, but this, this gives you a relative sense. Versus the Wisconsin wrap, which is 94% available, it has a PGH more like 84. So we think this is a way to, 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 to look at um, um, binder availability in the RAS, I'm sorry, in the wrap itself. Um, we also saw that this binder availability factor changes uh, and shows an effectiveness of recycling agents only for these very high PGH wraps. Uh, so that, that was kind of uh, interesting too. And finally, for the um, mixture cracking resistance evaluation, we have, we've done a number of things uh, to, to look at this. Uh, for intermediate temperatures, we've done a mixture Glover row at 20 C and 5 Hertz. Uh, so we do a black space for the mixture dynamic modulus. So we're plotting E star versus phase angle. Um, we've also done the Illinois flexibility index test. So we've looked at the flexibility index. Um, for low temperatures, we have done um, a, a rheological test, kind of like mixture Glover row, using the BBR. So it's the BBR mixture test. So you make tiny little specimens and test them in the BBR and get an S and an M value for the mixture itself. And we've also done a fracture test, like the flexibility index, using the uh, UTSST, which is a modified and improved TSRST. And so they have a cracking resistance index due to the environment. Um, uh, UNR, our partner UNR has done that, and our partner UNH has done a uh, mixture Glover Road uh, evaluation for us. What we found for these is we've done all these mixture tests after short term oven aging of the loose mix prior to compaction and after long term oven aging, five days at 85C. So we did the compacted sharp recommendation because uh, 9 54 was. Uh, recommendations were not available. And so we, we do find that we, we think we want to look at the mixture cracking evaluation after long-term oven aging. We want to look at it sometime in the future because we're worried about, again, the effectiveness of the recycling agents with aging. But um, 
we found that after short term of an aging, we can better discriminate the results and possibly try to set some thresholds for these tests, which is what we're trying to do right now by looking at comparison to field performance or possibly um, just comparison to the DOT control mixtures if we don't have enough field performance. So um, for mixture glove row, this is just, just looking at, uh, we have dynamic modulus versus phase angle. And again, this is the uh, Wisconsin mixes. So we're starting off with the yellow, and then we're adding in recycled materials uh, for this purple, so it's shifting it up and to the left. We're adding in um, the recycling agent to get the green, or we're using a softer binder uh, to get the light blue. And so those are all kind of up there. And when we add in the higher recycling agent dosages by our method, that's the black and the red, and so we're moving further down and to the right. So we're definitely seeing the right types of trends. Um, we're trying to come up with, you'll notice there's no thresholds on this graph because those don't exist for mixtures right now. So we're trying to come up with those right now. For the flexibility index, again, same, same material combinations from Wisconsin. In Illinois, they have set a short-term of an aging threshold, and the short-term of an aging results are shown as the top of this bar. The long-term of an aging results are shown at the top of the striped bar. So you can see, that obviously, that it reduces with long-term of an aging. Um, and we see, we see the right trends um, here uh, as before. Um, again, adding in recycled materials makes everything get worse. Uh, adding in either a softer binder seems to significantly help in this test. Um, adding in a little tiny bit of, of recycling agent doesn't help much. Uh, the, the letters here are the Chickies HSD, so it doesn't really help at all. Those are both in the same groups. But adding in more um, uh, recycling agent definitely improves uh, the situation in terms of this fracture parameter. For the low temperatures, uh, this is the rheological test, the BBR um, mixture test. And what you see here are some thresholds suggested by Utah after short term of an aging. And the short term of an aging is the, op the open symbols here. And uh, the darker symbols are after long term of an aging. And what you'll note here is that there is some very low severity cracking associated with these uh, mixtures. And again, this is the DOT control, the one with just the softer binder, and the one with the low uh, dosage of recycling agent. And so that, that makes sense. It's sort, of in, it's sort of past the thresholds that we see here. And again, we're trying to use this to com come up with some final evaluation recommendations. The ETSST parameter, we see the same trends. Um, the possible thresholds that we're thinking about here are around 8.5 and, and 19. So there's going to be a range like there is on uh, the binder blend the black space. And you can see after long-term of an aging, it gets worse in all cases. And when you add in a more recycling agent, like we think that we would recommend, you get better performance. So all of the parameters agree with each other, which is good. Um, we're also trying to look at the effect of different climates. Uh, what you can see here is something called cumulative degree days versus uh, time, basically. And uh, for the different, the five different field projects. And cumulative degree days are number of degree days above freezing, so above 32. And what you see here is the, the black dots are the coring dates. Uh, so we've had the Texas project the longest. Um, you, you can see that um, some of the ones that are flatter are the colder climates, like Wisconsin and Delaware. They're also the newer projects. And so what we're trying to see is how we can incorporate this into our recommendations for aging. Uh, UNR has done quite a bit of aging prediction using all kinds of uh, binder kinetics measurements and um, simulations of the climates. Uh, they looked at the same using the same base binder, the good New Hampshire base binder, and of course they found that uh, the predictions show that New Hampshire climate is the mildest, followed by Nevada, followed by Texas. And then they tried using the same climate and looking at the differences in the base binders, and they found that the Nevada polymer modified is the best, followed by the New Hampshire, followed by the Texas. And so they've done a lot of different things like that, and for each of the field sections as well. So we're trying to look at um, 
possibly trying to limit the magnitude of the aging effect and also the, the rate at which the aging is taking place or the aging susceptibility. And that, of course, is likely to be dependent on the climate. So that's all I have. Um, and I know it was a lot of information. Um, tried to hit the high points of what we're trying to come out of all of our results. And I'd be happy to take any questions now. Bob, do we want to do questions now or wait till after Matt? Uh, let's wait till after Matt. Amy, can you hang around till after Matt? Uh, sure, sure. Okay, next up uh, is uh, Matt Mueller. Matt's a graduate of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Much of his career was spent at the Illinois DOT where he worked in planning, design, construction, safety, research, and materials. The last nine years of his IDOT tenure, he held the position of materials engineer where he oversaw 10 labs tasked with the acceptance of materials and products used in the construction of Illinois roadways. Matt, thank you. Okay, do I have you, Dave? Yep, you got us. Excellent. Okay, thanks, Bob. And you can see the screen? Yep. Okay, you're going to do without my uh, lovely face here today, and uh, you, I'm just going to be that uh, shady character behind the screen. Uh, before I really get started, uh, I would like to uh, applaud and echo the work that uh, Amy presented, uh, 958. Also, for those of you who are looking for progress, 959 and 960, in this area, it, these are some uh, NCHRP studies that you want to be following. Uh, one other study that I don't have my hands on, but the, the Illinois DOT recently uh, uh, put out for the public is a long, long-term, very blunt study on uh, long-term, moderate-term length performance of some very high recycle pavements up to 100 percent and either LaDonna Rowden or Megan Swanson or Bob I'm sure you could get people access to that uh, but uh, going forward uh, what I want to talk about here and uh, I was happy to hear uh, Amy talk about recyclers recycling agents and not rejuvenators but I am going to very much stay focused on those who talk about rejuvenation and I don't want to back up from Amy's presentation I'm not not trying to go backwards I put this together um, without really well having anything to see that she was looking at and I'm again she's looking forward and I guess I would like to tell you I'm looking at the state of the practice as I see it right now so one of the first questions I would have of somebody who came in and was marketing a rejuvenator to me if I was an owner is is it something that repairs the mix or are you trying to market something that we're going to blend or mix into the binder prior to it going into a mix and if it's not those two cases then I'm really scratching my head because uh, you're gonna have to explain to me uh, what else does it do and I'm going to jump all the way to the last slide, which is, is there a test method to verify what you're telling me? So I threw out here a bunch of photos. Uh, Amy had some really good photos. And uh, if anybody was coming in to market to me and then said, you know, I've got this, uh, this product and it fixes things, um, I would be asking him, is, is this the type of road that you're talking about that your product would help us with? Or is a thermal cracked road. This is actually a bike path to receive no heavy traffic and those cracks are simply thermal cracks. Is this the type of thing that your rejuvenator uh, could help us with if we wanted to come in here, uh, mill this material up and, and use it a second time? Uh, can we go so far as a pavement that looks like this? We have plenty of these in Illinois. Um, Typically, we're milling them up. We're going over, throwing it in a stockpile. And as Amy said, uh, we used to have limits of 20%. And again, Illinois has gone far beyond that uh, with some significant consequences, I might add, uh, in the past few years. 
And uh, occasionally we get uh, caught a little late to the game, and um, a, a pavement starts to go ahead and ravel so significantly you would call it potholing. And uh, but just looking at this, would somebody that's marketing this rejuvenator say, you know, we can we can make this product that from the millings, so when you run it back through a plant, you can use it a second time and be very, very successful. So I asked the question, is a rejuvenator a piece of a fuzzy HMA puzzle? It's all fuzzy to me. So again, in order to get to solutions, we have to understand how things work. And I guess I in my background, I understand that there are a multitude of products all vying to be this rejuvenator and or possibly even a uh, recycling agent. So just following down through the boxes, does it blend or mix? And blending or mixing are very significantly two different things. How is it compatible with all the various asphalt binders? And if you're in the central part of the country, uh, asphalts were coming, the oils were coming out of Oklahoma. Maybe there was something a little more local, but uh, in the last number of years, we're getting a lot of things from up north. And so we have this quite extensive variety of base asphalts that are coming in, base oils, of which all these different asphalts are being made from. Uh, Amy hit on this many, many times. How is it stable? How long will this rejuvenation last? Is this something that you just, it's helping as a compaction aid, it wets everything up, and then, uh, you know, you don't see it anymore? Or uh, is it something that's just to help the recycle get through the plant so you don't further age that wrap or ras? Uh, while it's sitting in a silo storage situation. So that's where, is it sacrificial? And again, maybe maybe there are different products and they do different things. Maybe one of these is just clearly a sacrificial element to avoid that very damaging phase of production. Uh, does it simply add more liquid? And I will tell you time and time and time again, when we look at studies, or when I looked at studies, I'll use it in the past, uh, so many times what it appeared to be was quite simply a mix had additional liquid added to it, whatever that liquid might have been. And we all know that aids in compaction. We all know that at least initially that is going to aid in any type of tensile test or flexibility test. But if we're simply just adding liquid, why wouldn't we just add another tenth of asphalt? Uh, how is it applied? I've heard terms like marination of stockpiles. Uh, you spray it here, you spray it there. Uh, you put it into the uh, tank or you put it in right at the contractor's facility, uh, which gives you some indication there might be a stability problem and uh, it is used right there. And then very, very critically, will it affect other performance characteristics of the mix? And I know uh, Amy mentioned uh, using a, a paraffin-based uh, product uh, for research purposes. So I go right into my next slide of uh, a core that has been uh, split, and we're looking at the stripping test uh, unfortunately, in Illinois, we saw this a great deal um, for many, many years until we finally realized that certain materials were being added unknowingly to us, to our asphalt binders, that were creating a moisture susceptibility problem that was quite significant and led to numerous, I would say, a multitude of premature failure across the state. Um, when you start talking about some of these additives, and I'll just say waxy additives, uh, all of a sudden in the cold climate states, 
you, you might have done some things back when it was warm, but all of a sudden you have this complete Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde switch that clicks on, and now you have just created a thermal cracking problem. And for those familiar with thermal cracking, there is no easy solution once, once that crack starts. It's a, a fight to the finish. Uh, Amy mentioned we'll work on RAS, and uh, again, um, we all know RAS, or hopefully we all know RAS, a very, very, very hard asphalt, uh, way beyond the, the uh, typical PG grading. Uh, nobody really talks about PG grading when they talk about RAS. But how do we use such a resource? It is a resource. It's right there. We've got it in all of our communities. And is there a possibility? But uh, how is it possibly compatible with RAS and yet still compatible with RAP? That, that's... That would be an interesting one to have a seller answer to me. Uh, so again, um, in just going down to, to bring this to closure, when somebody says, I've got this great product, it'll work for everything, um, is this road too far gone? Or how about this? Um, can you really marinate that and bring that back? Um, and last, and it's something that uh, seems to be glossed over many times, but uh, I know state agencies clearly have a responsibility for uh, not only the safety of the public, but also their own staff. And uh, I would be right out in front with anybody that was coming to me saying, uh, we're going to have a long discussion about the health risks of using these products. And... The simple response is, oh, there aren't any known hazards, uh, kind of goes with question number two. Uh, are you telling me that you haven't looked yet and that is the reason you don't know? Um, that's a very dangerous and uh, uh, bad slope to get on to. Uh, so we really need to have down at the bottom, uh, we need to have complete safety data sheets. Uh, whenever we're using any new materials that uh, we're not familiar with. So bringing it home, last slide, how can a buyer, the owner, measure the value of a rejuvenator? And again, I, I applaud Amy for uh, pushing out there and trying to get some test methods, trying to get some standards. I know some others are, are working down that path, and, and we need to support those efforts every way we can. So there can be industry standards that, we can compare to. There are test methods that we all understand and can follow. Uh, we have results that can be accurately measured. There's some sort of measuring tool after the test method has been followed. And as Amy said there uh, towards the end, she's working on target values for some of these test, me test methods. Um, obviously, anybody would want to know uh, before they bought uh, a min and a max. And then uh, how is, and this is always a challenge for state agencies, uh, low bid contracts have to have it in the contract. It's not something to be resolved later. It's something that we have to have knowledge of going out to bid. How do you specify this material? And then quite finally, uh, worker safety. And my little images at the bottom simply are, are just a, a visual way of saying, if you can't answer these six questions, you're finding yourself in the black and white photo. If you're working towards those six answers, you're on the way to another oil-based product, which is gasoline, that can clearly, it's got an industry standard. There are definitely test methods. It can be accurately measured. You can get 87, 90, 93 octane. Uh, people know how to buy it and get it out to their facility, and we know how to handle it quite safely. So uh, that's all I have, Bob. I'll turn it back to you. Matt? Right. Thanks, yes. Matt. This is Amy. Could you, tell, could you say one more time that publication that, uh, not the NCHRP projects, but the other publication that you mentioned at the very beginning again, please? There, I, I don't have the exact title of it. Uh, the one that the, is the uh, Illinois DOT's long-term aging study? 
uh, Ahmad El Khadi. Yeah, uh, I think we have that. The okay. Authors. Okay. Yeah, you should have had it. it. Came out approximately in the last couple of months. And I just yeah, want to I think make we sure have everybody's that. got that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Any questions? Uh, how are we handling questions from online? Uh, you can uh, type them out, or you, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask questions through Skype. So, in the uh, we've got a dozen or so people here in, in MnDOT's office. Uh, any questions from the peanut gallery here? Are they using any of this recently, or CIR or SFER? I'll repeat the question. The question was, are any... Uh, Recycling additives being used in cold mix, cold in place recycling, or cold central plant that either of you know? Uh, I'll go first, I guess, and because that's easy for me. I don't know. Uh, almost all of our cold in place recycling was being done on local agency projects, and they handled that. Uh, I will tell you, I I know secondhand that yes, many people came to them and marketed products that had many unknown uh, parameters and they were experimenting. They, our locals in Illinois are very financially starved and uh, the concept of not having to haul away or do anything, cold in place recycling, very. Um, <coughs> interesting to them but they they recognize we got to add something and uh, unfortunately uh, without a lot of direction I, I think a lot of various both upstanding and maybe not so folks have been uh, plying their trade across Illinois uh, not that I'm familiar with we have a project in Florida my colleague does that I'm working on and we are looking at Hot in place recycling with some re with 60 to 100 percent wrap, and for the hot in for not hot in place for the hot central plant recycling, we're using recycling agents, but for the cold, we're not. Okay. I, I, I will add to that. Uh, I was in Maine several years ago. Maine had a very robust program for cold in place recycling. I don't have a name for you, but the Maine DOT very regularly use that for their road network they're they're and uh and very successful out there i i couldn't begin to tell you the additives that were used though we just had a uh, uh an online comment uh from joe larusso that said cir emulsions typically contain a good slug of rec b type rejuvenator um i'm not sure what rec b is but just fyi um one question I have for Amy, uh, when you consider uh, RAP or RAS, and uh, uh, you, you kind of outline the importance of characterizing that uh, before you do any kind of uh, trial mix designs, how important, I would think, the, the variability of the, the stockpile is, is really important, um, but how is that being addressed in your uh, NCHRP work? No, but I agree with you. Okay. Um, another uh, <clears throat> clarification from Joel Russo back to CIR. <clears throat> Rec B is reclamite uh, with maltine. It's a maltine type. Uh, I remember maltine from my undergrad work. It's not malto meal. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, 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 that, that's one uh, question I had. Um, and are you looking, you mentioned the, uh, I think you're doing the iFit performance test. Um, are you also looking at any low temperature uh, cracking type uh, mixed performance tests? Yes, we're looking at the UTSST. It's, it's, it's a improved TSRST, so they, they, they do the test where they restrain the beam and, and, and reduce the temperature in the in the chamber and then they also do one with an unrestrained beam so that they can get the the thermal stress and the thermal strain and and they it's a much more uh, com comprehensive look at uh, low temperature cracking this is a uh, UNR developed that okay. so yes we have a, we have a fracture test at both intermediate and low temperatures and a rheology test at both intermediate and low temperatures to look at the cracking 
performance. Any other questions? The form was very equation. The one the equation is short of the prediction to show that we need to have the grading for the rap and grass. Is that is that a standard practice that you do you always have those parameters available or is it something that you need to show the design? Like? Or uh, I, I I want to hear you talk if you have some guidelines for people who don't have or the rap or RAS performance grading. So, Amy, I don't, I'm assuming you didn't hear that, but the question was on your uh, predictive equation for, I think it was for the, the high temperature, composite high temperature grade for yes. the uh, the wrap RAS and uh, base binder. Um, the question was, do those, are those commonly available uh, yeah, pieces of Yeah, I know equation? what he's asking. He wants to know, does he have to extract and recover from the recycled materials, which is the big pain. Um, so, yes, if you don't have that value from, from somewhere else, yes, you would have to. Uh, and I think that also gets to your variability of the wrap pile. Uh, how often does that change? Um, I think the good thing about uh, our recycling agent dosage selection is you're only doing DSR tests on that, on that, um, to get that PG high temperature grade, and you're only doing it on unaged material. So you don't have to, you don't have to do any PAV aging. Um, you know, to get that number, but you do have to extract and recover the, the wrap binder and or the RAS binder, yes. Uh, what about the, do the equation for the dosage? Is it specific to any kind of recycling agent or it is you apply it? Now, that, that, that equation is meant to be general for the sort of newer tall oils, vegetable oils, and bio oils. Um, it does not include the older aromatic type products. When we include the aromatic type products, it's still a very good relationship. It might change that uh, slope to 1.7 instead of 1.8. Uh, again, if the manufacturer of the recycling agent has a better number to use there, that would be fine. Uh, or if you have more experience on your specific recycling agent, then that would be fine. But that is a combination of all the different types of uh, recycling agents that we've looked at, which is pretty comprehensive. I understand that there's recycling agents coming out left and right. I understand that, but uh, we tried to do the best that we could and get a good spectrum. Thank you. Anything else online? We're up to uh, been about an hour, and uh, I thought this was uh, really good, Amy and, and Matt. I know I um. That's just a comment. Uh, opened up my eyes quite a bit. Um, so with that, I guess we'll uh, conclude. Thank you very much, Amy and Matt. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Y'all have a good day.